I see people jumping on. Hello, everyone. We're going to give everyone a minute to get signed on and get comfortable, and uh, we'll start shortly. All right, so I think we're gonna get started here. All right, so hello, Equitana USA family. I am Nicole Forbes, the Content and Event Activation Manager for Equitana USA. And if you've been keeping up with our virtual programming, this is the last time you'll have to hear me introduce myself. <laughs> Today is the final day of our month-long equestrian celebration, and what a month it has been. Uh, we've been incredibly fortunate to have so many of our presenters that would have been uh, at the Kentucky Horse Park this year join us virtually um, and share their knowledge and passion for the industry. And today is no different. I'm incredibly honored to be moderating today's panel uh, that we'll be discussing the traditions and changes of the equestrian world. Um, this discussion came to mind very early in the stages of Equitana USA's planning. Um, our entire team, both equestrians and non-equestrians alike, were all in agreement that we wanted Equitana to be something more than just a trade show. Um, so we put a great deal of effort into creating a multifaceted um, education-based uh, programming schedule. But on top of that, we just didn't want to educate. We want people to turn that education into action and impact positive change in the industry. And that's basically where this panel came from. So you're about to meet three incredibly passionate equestrians who happen to be breaking barriers and challenging industry standards when it comes to uh, modernizing their respective sports. Um, I'm pleased to welcome Carson Cressley, Micah Deligdish, and Danny G. Waldman. And with that, I'm going to let each panelist introduce themselves before we dive into our discussion here. So uh, Carson, why don't you start? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Carson Cressley, and um, you might recognize me from television. Uh, because I uh, did a couple of different shows, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, How to Look Good Naked, uh, Dancing with the Stars, RuPaul's Drag Race. Um, have a couple Emmys from those. I'm very lucky, but um, my real passion is horses. And uh, because I grew up in an equestrian family, my grandparents had a huge Shetland pony farm, if you can believe. Um, I've always been exposed to equines, and uh, I grew up showing hackney ponies and Shetland ponies. And when I was about 10 or 11, I was like, uh, ponies are cool, but I need a horse. Um, and that started a long um, uh, career with American Saddlebred Show Horses. Um, they are the supermodels of the show ring. They're so fun. Um, I've also shown Frisians um, to a couple world titles. And I've just now, just for the fun of it, um, to be a well-rounded old-fashioned horseman, um, I just started taking um, hunter and jumping lessons from Archie Cox here in LA. Um, so um, yeah, and I have a farm in Pennsylvania, but I just love all things horses and um, they're my true passion. Awesome, and Danny, how about you? Hi, I'm Danny Waldman. I am originally from New York. I live in the Netherlands now. Um, I represent Israel, an international show jumping competition. So I'm a jumper rider. And yeah, I came from a really non-horse family at all. Like my father was a squash player and my mother played also squash and tennis. And I had no, my family had nothing to do with horses and I fell in love when I was about eight years old. And I moved over to Holland about seven years ago, six or seven years ago and met my husband here. And uh, now we have about 600 horses that we breed and develop. And then I show sort of only at the, well, I try to show the high level. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I do it, but I try. And uh, yeah, so, but we have lots of horses and yeah, that's me. Before we move on to Maiko, what the heck is squash? I've never heard of this. <laughs> what? Squash, you said? Squash, it's a racket sport. <laughs> um, it plays, it's played like in a small indoor court um, and you can use all, all four walls. And it's like a very long racket. About this small little squash bowl. 
<laughs> Watch ball. I learn something new every day. <laughs> I thought you were going to interrupt and say, did you just say 600 horses? Because <laughs> yeah, that's where I was like almost fell off my chaise lounge. <laughs> um, that's well, incredible. Yeah, it is overwhelming, actually. <laughs> Understandable. Um, and Micah. Hi, I'm Micah Dillard-Wish. Um, I also work in Planet Israel, but in dressage. Um, I've been riding dressage pretty much from the start since I was five. Um, and I'm year-round in Wellington, Florida. We have our training stable down here. Um, last summer, we were in Europe competing as well. I went to European Championships. And then uh, we had our first Israeli Nations Cup team during the season. Um, and I'm really obviously passionate about dressage and kind of bringing this level of modernization to the sport. Um, and we don't have 600 horses. <laughs> we have a lot less horses than that, but, uh, but yeah. And uh, I'm expecting my first baby in two weeks. Amazing. <laughs> I know this actually worked out in your favor because we were hoping that you join us at Equitana Live and um, that wasn't going to be possible, but now it is. So <laughs> you think I'd be able to get on a plane? <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So we're going to jump right in here. Um, when you think of traditions in the horse world, what is the first thing that comes to mind? And Carson, we'll start with you. Oh, this is going to sound crazy, but the first thing that just pops into mind, literally top of head, is the clothing. Um, and I know I'm a clothing guru, so that makes sense. But for me, like the, um, what we wear seems so traditional, whether it's in the hunter field, you know, those show disciplines that are based in tradition, like hunters or American saddlebreds, or, um, you know, even Western, I think there's a romantic kind of, none of this clothing is necessary today. We have, you know, technical fibers and fabrics, but we still, in those traditional disciplines, we go back to, very old fashioned ways of dressing for the romance and the tradition of it all. Danny, what are your thoughts? I know you have some um, insight into the fashion, certainly. Yeah, I mean, uh, my first thought, of course, is also the fashion, especially like the shape of the blazers and, you know, okay, they're not made of wool anymore, but they have that sort of very classic traditional look and not my favorite, honestly. <laughs> if it were up to me, we would be like decked out like NASCAR wearing like, sporty shirts and sponsors. So tradition, I, I get it. And I, but that is what I think of uh, first thing, but it's, yeah, maybe we can shift away from that one day. It's funny you mentioned the sponsors too. Um, I know jockeys and horse racing kind of within the past two years, maybe just got permission to get sponsors on their breaches. So yeah, yeah. like you said, it's, it's still very um, dated. And uh, yeah. Michael, what was your first thought? Well, so I think dressage is one of the most traditional sports of any sport. Um, and we're really, we have our heels dug in the ground or heels really down <laughs> in our traditions. And if we're gonna go on fashion, dressage fashion is probably the most <laughs> classic, military inspired. Every every time at a horse show, we're all like, why do we wear this? We said we should wear white pants. This is ridiculous. Um, but a little bit what Danny was saying, thankfully we're not in big, heavy wool coats with shoulder pads. Mm -hmm. um, I think if we're going to talk about fashion, you know, a big part, a big thing that's changed in dressage is the, um, we no longer wear the top hats and we wear the helmets. And I think that's really important because it brings us more into the realm of sport rather than like artistic expression that we're treating ourselves more like athletes, uh, which kind of goes hand in hand with wearing more athletic fiber, beautiful material, um, more flattering clothing. Um, I love what Danny said about wanting to be decked out like NASCAR because I was just talking with my coach about like, think about the technical advances in gymnastics and swimming, what they used to wear uh, years ago in swimming versus what they wear now to make them better athletes. Um, and it's kind of similar. And I don't know about in your discipline, but in dressage, there are sponsor logos. Um, and I don't know if this is an international thing or a US thing, I'd have to double check, but like they measure our logos on the south. That's too. It's an FBI rule. Yeah, so it can only be a certain size. You can't be a a billboard for your sponsors really. <laughs> and you can be a little bit clever with the patches and things like that. 
code or the bonnet, but uh, yeah, they definitely limit that sort of thing, uh, expression in some way. Um, so that raises a good point with the FEI kind of monitoring that. Um, why do you think these organizations are so strict with uh, maintaining these traditions? Danny. <laughs> That's a great question that I have asked them and I have gotten zero response about. Um, I do know that related to Corona, there was some new discussions within the FBI regarding because we couldn't have sort of spectators at the law at the events that they were thinking to actually change the rules on the sizing of things because then they, when it was broadcast on streaming services, you could actually see the logos and because otherwise the corporate sponsorship was basically zero. So I know they've, that's sort of been a discussion point recently within the FEI, but as to why they have these restrictions, I think because it is a military-based sport and it is so traditional and people are averse to change. And uh, yeah, I'm, hopefully that won't always be the case, but people are always hesitant to, to make changes and it's never been like that in the past. Right. You get disrupted. There's always that discussion. I get it. My like people say it to me. The FEI has contacted me directly and said that I am like ruining the sport of show jumping because I'm <laughs> because I don't look elegant enough. And uh, I actually looked up the definition of elegant because I thought, am I not elegant? God, <laughs> I don't know. And in the end, actually, I thought I fulfilled the definition of elegant. So yeah. I think it's a discussion point as to like, do we want logos? And is that killing something, or is it actually maybe making things better? So, I don't well, know. and beyond the logo, like for guys, for example, when you look in the USDF rule book, you see the word conservative over and over again. Coat must be of a conservative color. Gloves must be of a conservative color. And that um, is also open to interpretation of the technical delegate at that show, for example. So one technical delegate might say, okay, your powder blue coat is acceptable, maybe one isn't. And especially with soft, because it's a subjective sport, not only are you subject to the judgment of the TV, but of the judge itself, and is that expression beyond logos, but relating to color, bling, cut of your coat, cut of your saddle pads, style of your bridle, is that taking away from the elegance or the harmony uh, of your presentation of your horse, which is the, almost like the basic definition of the massage. I think you bring up a good point there, uh, elegance versus harmony. I think harmony is what everyone's striving for more so, and maybe we should kind of drop the, you know, elegant per se. Um, and Carson, you mentioned a good point on kind of the romantic aspect of the tradition that's involved in this. Um, would you ever want to change that? Or do you really like that component? Uh, I think it really depends on the discipline. I think the ones that are super athletic, you know, the Olympic di disciplines, and if you're, if you're flying over like gigantic jumps, I mean, that's a very athletic kind of technical thing where I would think you would want to update the, those traditions and make sure it's the most technically advanced and using the best possible, you know, carbon fiber for helmets and the most amazing breathable fabrics. But I think in the really traditional ones, saddlebred horses, for example, or even, you know, hunters, that they're rooted in tradition because we don't, there's no real need for that kind of riding in the real world anymore. It's based in something old fashioned and romantic that we hearken back to. And we unfortunately don't really have sponsors in our world um, because our events tend to not be Olympic, they're, they're not generally televised. So we are very traditional, whether it's, you know, I think a hunter class or a saddlebred class, it is old fashioned. And there are some updates, so we're not passing out and we're not wearing like, you know, mohair in July. <laughs> it's still really, really traditional. And I like that for those specific types of, of disciplines. I think that, um, you know, if we try to modernize it, there's there's no point to doing what we do. It's it's such an old fashioned idea to be, you know, field hunting or fox hunting or, um, you know, uh, riding a five gated saddle horse. We don't have to use them anymore to um, survey our lands. Now we just do this for this fun, romantic kind of escape. Well, that brings up a good point. Um, 
So it doesn't need to be uh, just on fashion, but if, when you think of traditions in your respective sports, is there one that comes to mind that you really would like to change? If you could get it done tomorrow, what would that be? Um, Danny, let's go with you. Good question. Um, yeah, my answer normally is always starting with the fashion, but that's more because of like a personal thing, not because I think it's necessarily the most pressing issue. I think for me, anything traditional regarding sponsorship is a big thing for me because I think our sport will struggle to evolve and grow and become more accessible to people if we don't have larger corporate sponsors. Um, so for me, if we could open up the rules so that corporate sponsors actually can get benefit from the marketing side of it within our sport, that would be a tradition that I think we sort of have to, otherwise our sport is never going to go anywhere. But I think that, like Carson said, that, that comes from the really athletic Olympic disciplines, you know, where we need the funding and we need it to be a sport for, and we need people to view it as a sport and it needs that, and it is a sport. Whereas a lot of the other disciplines tend to be more hobbies and there is a romantic nature to those things. I think show jumping to me has its history, but it, it to, I see it as like such a modern, you know, active daily sport that I'm doing. I don't think of it in its traditional kind of romantic way. So I want like corporate yeah. changes so that we can actually move forward and get some funding and get exposure. Absolutely. I mean, you're jumping like six foot castles. It's, uh, <laughs> it's time for some sponsors on there. Um, Micah, what about you? What would you change tomorrow if you could? Well, I think it's a little similar to what Danny's question on the map there, because I think what dressage struggles with a little bit is that it straddles kind of both elements of what Carson and Danny are talking about. Dressage is a very romantic, artistic, classical discipline. However, it is also extremely athletic, demanding, and an Olympic sport that requires large amounts of sponsorship and funding and support and what's really tough there and i think what's been the decade long debate about dressage is how to make it more spectator friendly more sponsor friendly without losing the integrity of the artistic side and the classicalism of the sport because the diehard fans uh that's really what they care about is the sport and attempts at making dressage more commercial have tended to fall flat because of sacrificing those pieces of the sport. Um, and it's not without trying. I think the FEI is trying very hard. USEF is trying very hard to figure out ways to improve that, whether it's the live scoring, the audience scoring, participation, um, the attempt at the short Grand Prix. Um, <laughs> the new Olympic format, uh, which is a little different for the dressage tests. Um, and, you know, trying, trying to figure out ways because like, again, what Danny said is uh, like, for example, in Europe, the showing is much more professional based. So it is a spectator sport. I mean, you go to Foster Bow, you go to Aachen and it's like 40,000 people. You can't even explain it. To <laughs> and think of like the biggest state fair you've ever been on times a million, right? Because you've got the, the best of the best of every discipline competing. You've got vendors, you've got shopping, you've got the Olympians doing camel races and Icelandic ponies. <laughs> it's like, it's everything. And it's like, that's their culture. Whereas showing here in dressage is much more for the amateur. So it's, ve it's very different. It's, that's not so much a spectator sport um, because you're not going to watch the best of the best and have a a week of fun and uh, meet and greets and things like this. Um, so it, it's finding that balance, I think, for dressage that's really tough, but I think we're slowly figuring that out. Yeah, you mentioned a couple ways that um, dressage is already trying to incorporate some modernization. Um, all three of you are incredibly internationally traveled. So being that you know we would love to replicate that european flair at our horse shows here in the states is there one element from international shows that you would really like to see um kind of more put into the culture in the states oh 
Go ahead, Carson. <laughs> oh, I was I was gonna say um, anything that makes it like a festival and a celebration, and not just you know horses going around in a circle. And I think you know um, World Equestrian Games when they were in Lexington, I went to that. That was really entertaining uh, because there was so much more than just. Um, the horses and I know we're all supposed to be horse centric but I also like some you know entertainment I love some good shopping um, some merchantainment and um, I just think you know that festival atmosphere is a way to get people that maybe like horses but don't really understand showing or show jumping or saddle horses or hunters to get them on the grounds and get them exposed and that's how we all fall you know a lot of people discovery is so important to discover equestrian sports because kids aren't growing up with a neighbor next door that has a pony and they're like, oh, I want to try doing that. Now we have to really get people to see what we do because if you don't see it, you don't know that you want to try that. You don't know that you want to do it and be involved in equestrian sports. No, that's a great point. And Danny, I mean, you already talked on that because of the accessibility. You know, sponsors could help that. But um, yeah, totally. yeah, yeah, is there more international components that you'd like to see added to uh, competitions in the States? Yeah, I mean, I think Carson makes a really good point there. It needs to be an event that people actually want to come and, and enjoy, like like they do at the U.S. Open. I mean, I remember as a kid going to the U.S. Open, and yes, you go to watch the, the big matches, but it's also because it's the whole, the shopping and the culture and there's food. and it, It's an event. You, you go and you spend the day and you actually enjoy the whole thing. But for me, honestly, one of the main elements of European shows that I really like that the US shows don't have is that they're actually much shorter. Most European shows are Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and you can actually have a life. <laughs> um, and I like that. I like that I can go home to my family and I can spend, you know, Sunday night through Wednesday night, essentially, or even Thursday with my family. I can have a routine. I can have, you know, a sort of a settled feeling whereas in the u.s a lot of the shows start on like monday or tuesday and you're there the whole week and then it gets drawn out and then classes go at eight o'clock in the morning and nobody's watching that you know so i love like if it was compacted a little bit so that friday saturday sunday it was really focused on sport and like carson said you can make it like a compact event that's fun to go to versus this like very long strung out kind of yeah long days and things that people get tired of I almost wonder if that's, you know, kind of culturally ingrained too, because, you know, I feel like a lot of the American lifestyle is go, 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 go. You're just, you pride yourself on being exhausted and it's not cool. <laughs> oh, that's like a terrible American mentality. I mean, yeah. It's great. People keep working and, right. you know, I mean, a lot of people are not so such hard workers in Europe because of that. But there is that element of just being exhausted all the time. Yeah. Um, and Micah, have you seen anything um, internationally that you'd really like to bring to the States? I think that festival culture for me was, it's the most fun because even when you're a competitor, it gives you it, so much more enjoyment out of being there and the camaraderie of, of, around the athletes and their teams and um, trying to figure out how to do that more in dressage, I, I would feel maybe like an almost similar event would be like Devon. Um, I think Devon at least used to have that kind of festival feeling. And I think that's especially for dressage, why it's really important to support events like that. Um, you know, beyond this year, like things like normal. Um, I really like what Danny said about the scheduling, because I didn't even really think about that. That like, during the season, we like we jog on Tuesday, and then Wednesday, and then Thursday's the Grand Prix, and the feminine. <laughs> all week and you're exhausted and the horses are exhausted and I like my husband knows if I'm showing he's not seeing me at all like I'm right. gone all week yeah. and yeah if you're doing a grand prix at eight o'clock during the week we can be there we can watch mm -hmm. yeah so. um so we touched on this a little bit um I know we talked about the FEI um not really assisting and moving the sports forward and whatnot um, so in your opinion, who do you believe should help lead this change? Do we need to get the younger generations involved, the older generations? Is this an organizational thing um, like USAF or FBI? Like who should be held responsible for pushing modernization along? Uh, Carson, start with you. Okay. Um, I don't know too much about the FBI, but they sound like 
the manager at the Hermes store. Like, you know, they're, they're very old fashioned. You're not just coming in there and like telling them how to do things. I just had a, a moment there. Um, I think, you know, we have a great organization in the saddle seat disciplines called the United Professional Horsemen's Association. And they're really the trainers of our sport. And they have a young uh, professionals uh, group and I, I think young people are really the key. I think, you know, once you're set in your ways and you've been doing this for forever, you know, you're more comfortable not changing. But young people who, um, you know, this is a very challenging business. It's extremely expensive. Uh, it's hard for people to access it. Um, so keeping your business as a professional horse person thriving is really important, especially to young people because they're in it for the long haul. So I always, you know, think that that's, um, really important for young people to figure out how can we make our sport more accessible? How can we modernize it? How can we make it more inclusive? And yes, our organizations like the USEF and the FBI, they can all try that. But I think a grassroots from the actual people in the trenches is always more effective. So I think we've, in our sport, we've had a lot of great ideas that came out of the Young Professionals Association. And uh, eventually they worked their way up to USEF and get in the rule book and we make these changes. Danny, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, you know, it's one thing to have actual rules changed and things like that through the governing bodies, but real change, I think almost in anything in life has to come a bit grassroots, has to come from the youth. You know, there has to be this feeling that the change is happening where you're not gonna be able to stop it. It can't just be one person in the FEI or the USEF saying like, all right, we're gonna change this rule and that's it. It needs to come where they start to feel like, look, we have to make this change because it's already happened within the population or in the community. I mean, and I don't mean to take this to a personal place, but like there are now a number of kids riding with feathers in their hair. And I by no means think that anyone needs to ride with feathers in their hair other than <laughs> I like to do it. But if you see, multiple kids on different continents. I mean, there's a girl in China, there's multiple kids in Europe, there's kids all over the US, some in Canada, wearing feathers in their hair. And then when the FEI comes to me and says, well, you can't do it, when there starts to be multiple people making those changes and standing up for themselves and saying, okay, I'm gonna be an individual, I'm gonna change this sport, I don't have to look like everybody else, then I think the FEI and the governing bodies at least have a lot more trouble to say we're going to stick to the old traditions and it, that's what pushes things forward that's how i see it no it's a great point it's like the whole um what's the adage about you know you have one stick in your hand you snap it it's done you have a bunch of sticks you can't do it you know just by yourself so uh micah what are your thoughts uh, i think what's really great is uh, like in the time we live in it's social media and uh, with young people being able to express themselves on a more global scale. Um, we are able to activate change on our own in that way, whether it's uh, different campaigns, uh, like a big one is wearing a helmet, uh, or uh, like I'm in a Facebook group of young professionals, and we are always sharing ideas and encouraging each other and helping each other out. Um, especially when it comes to kind of how to financially succeed in this industry as a young professional, which is not easy at all. Um, and then encouraging these younger riders to get involved in their GMOs, uh, going to the USDF convention, finding ways to be more active because dressage in itself, again, is a more, um, our overall population of riders tend to be a little older or you know they support themselves in that way and the younger riders need to develop a stronger voice to encourage that sort of change on a larger scale of where they want to see the sport going and for them to kind of like develop this experience especially in the competitive realm to understand really what it takes for this sport to survive and improve if they want to keep doing it for the rest of their lives can i add one point uh, uh, yeah, I, one other thing, I mean, that I think is, we talk about grassroots change and the youth and kids getting more involved. I think that's great what you say, Micah, that 
really you need to get people involved sort of with, with the change and what they want to see change but i think there is also an element for our governing bodies one good example you said the helmets is like i think that it should be mandatory for anyone under 18 actually i think it should be mandatory for everybody to wear an airbag safety vest when we ride I know too many friends that have been paralyzed or had catastrophic injuries. And like, that's a change that I think is necessary for modernization of the sport, especially when it is a sport and to be considered a sport, we need to take safety as a really important role. And I wish that some of the governing bodies would step in in that case and make some of these rule changes because those are things that actually will protect us and that, you know, that, that speaks to it really being a sport. So it's both, I think. No, and that's a good point too about why they haven't addressed safety concerns because that almost seems like the easiest, you know, excuse yeah. if you want to call it for changes is safety. You know, we've come um, eons from where we were years and years ago. So that's a very good point. Um, uh, both Danny and Micah, you kind of touched on this, um, but I think a lot of younger people these days don't feel like they have a platform big enough to speak out. And if they say something, it's just going to be swept away and, you know, they don't feel heard. Um, would you have any advice for these people? You know, can one person really make a difference? Carson? <laughs> oh, um, yeah, I think that um, I think everybody has a platform nowadays because of social media. And you look to people like Greta Thunberg, um, she's one person. She's all over the world. She's like 17 years old. Um, she's a great example of um, using a vo your voice for something you're passionate about. And I do think that nobody is more passionate than horse people um, about what we do and about our horses and about our uh, equestrian community. And I think through social media now, we have everybody has an amazing platform to at least get a conversation started. And um, I'm just a big believer in like everybody has an opportunity to be heard and maybe it's not always easy and maybe you have to schlep to the U USCF convention um, if there's you know a rule that you're passionate about that um, needs to be changed or maybe you have to start a group on Facebook um, to you know galvanize your local breed or uh, community uh, but I think we are very lucky that we live in this era where we do have a um, that kind of platform to uh, get the word out about issues that we're passionate about. Absolutely. And Danny, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, like Carson says, uh, social media allows for basically everyone to have a voice these days. Um, I don't think you need to have a big following or something or feel as though you will be heard to, to be heard. I think if you say something passionately and you believe in it and you fight for something, you know, I think that that can make a difference. I mean, one person isn't necessarily going to cause change to happen, but it can be a catalyst. And I think that that's the important part is that we get these discussions going and we talk about these things. You know, if we want our sport to modernize and move forward, we have to talk about it. We have to bring up these issues and one person can at least start that and then, you know, talk to their friends and put it on social media. I mean, get it out there and then those ideas can evolve from there. I love that, yeah, don't expect change, but be the catalyst, that's great. Um, Micah, what are your thoughts? I agree with both Carson and Danny. I don't know if I have much to add that point, but um, but yeah, I think if you're, what you believe in, I think if it, if you're, if it makes sense and it's possible and you can get enough following, like if it's something that will help the sport that you believe in, I'm sure you're not the only person who feels that way. And so by at least having that courage to speak up and put it out there, there will be support. That's how change happens. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, no, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's just having that courage to kind of, you know, click the send button. You just got to do it. <laughs> Leap off the cliff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The lemmings will follow. <laughs> um, I want to touch on the socioeconomic impacts of our industry just for a minute here. Um, we've already kind of mentioned how many barriers to entry there are. And a lot of people outside of the industry see um, horse sports as elitist and traditionally white. So how do we go about changing that perspective and um, really increasing accessibility to the everyday person? 
Carson, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, it is that is that is probably like our number one like PR problem is that you know it's expensive, it's elitist, it's you know I I don't have access to this sport, and that that is a huge problem because you know I'm a big believer. I love what I do um, with the saddle horses, with the Frisians, but you know my niece has barrel horses, like anything horsey. I am like an evangelist and I, you know, anyone I can tell, I'm like, this is so great. Oh, you should do this. Oh, this is great for your kids. Um, I'm a big believer that like, if you're enjoying the party, the more the merrier, let's get everybody involved and let's share um, our great sport with, with the world. Because we all know as equestrians that nothing raises better kids than horses. Um, there's nothing more uh, zen. And if you're stressed at work than to get out on a horse and just, you know, go on a trail ride, whatever it is, they are so wonderful. We need to invite everybody to the party. How do we do that? Yeah, it's very challenging. We have um, fewer people are in contact with horses. Fewer. There's so many other choices for kids, for sports. Um, it's expensive. Uh, it's deemed a country club sport by many where, you know, and tennis had the same thing. It was just like, how do we get, you know, more people involved And the USTA started you know, building inner city tennis centers and making sure that everybody had access. And I think we just, as, as a equestrian community, whether it's an Olympic discipline or whether it's trail riding, or we need to figure out how do we allow people access to what we do. Social media obviously is a great way for people to discover horses, but we need to get people hands on um, and not have it be exclusive. And I don't know how we do that with so many barriers, but it's something that we must absolutely um, address in creative modern ways to make sure that we have a sport in you know, 20, 30, 40 years. No, and I think that's a good point because we had another panel about um, urban farms and bringing horses to the local communities and, and how tough that is. Um, but you know, a lot of them only address um, at risk youth or certain programs um, because of funding. And yeah, not necessarily just, you know, your average Joe from next door who doesn't have an opportunity to see a horse. So that's a good point. Um, Danny, what are your thoughts? I know you mentioned the sponsorship, which I think is huge. Yeah, but actually, you know, I think there's a little bit more to it. I think that professionals in the sport, like myself, like my husband, like Mike, I mean, we have an opportunity. We sort of have a wealth of knowledge and about the industry and we have networks. I think it's sort of our professional responsibility to actually open up our knowledge and our stables and for, to expose people to the fact that being involved in the horse industry doesn't mean that you have to be a rider. It doesn't mean that you have to have money. It doesn't mean any of that. You can actually be involved in the horse industry in so many different ways. You can breed horses. You can build courses. You can be part of the governing bodies. You can you know, be a groom, you can work in the stable, you can work on the yard, you know, there's so many different facets to our industry that don't involve somebody not having access to it. And I think as a professional, and I hope that other professionals will sort of follow suit as I plan to do and want to do more of, is actually open my stable up to people and offer jobs and offer education and say, hey, come look and see what there is to do here. and actually sort of expose our knowledge to other people because i think when we keep it all to ourselves and everything gets so secretive it makes it impossible for anyone to enter the sport and we need to be more transparent in everything that happens so that more people can get involved that's a great point i think that you know will create um, longevity in the sport and that's something that yeah it's, it's, it's hard to find mentors these days or anyone is really willing to open up I feel like they think they're getting, you know, a competitor or they might, you know. Yeah, I mean, everyone is so like, you know, grabbing onto their own things and they're so terrified to to yeah. share it with anybody, but we're never going to grow if we don't actually share our knowledge. I mean, professionals need to sort of step up and say, hey, like, this isn't about just keeping everything for ourselves. This is actually about, we need to make it bigger. And the more people... Of, for, for diversity, for everything, the more people that we can have involved, the better the sport will be. It will be more well-rounded. It will, you know, have a much bigger base and that's what we need. Absolutely. And Micah, what do you think? So I so love what Danny said about it being the professional's responsibility because at the end of the day, in this 
circumstance, this is how the grassroots happen. So you have a riding school in an area where you can hold like uh, an open house or create a club through the local elementary school or junior high or high school where students that aren't already equestrian leaning can find a way into a stable and be around the horses, you know, offer that, offer affordable lesson programs um, once or twice a week where you're getting these kids in the stable where they can be around horses where it's not going to cost them hundreds of dollars. Um, and I think us as professionals or riding stable schools, we have to do that. We have to make ourselves vulnerable to that, open ourselves up to allowing more people into the stable like that. Um, mentorship program. Um, from a riding perspective, I was lucky enough to be able to be a working student where I equate being a working student very similarly to in college, students who are privileged enough to have internships where they don't have to get a job right away. Not everyone has that privilege where they can be a working student that's not getting paid. So either pay your working students or you need to develop grant pro more. There are grant programs, the Dressage Foundation is exceptional, but certain programs where you're allowing these people in the stable where they can be around the horses where it's not viewed as privilege. Um, and you're encouraged the, the riding, you're encouraging the saddle time, the education, um, pony club type activities where you're, you're doing outreach. Um, and I really do think that starts at home. And then our organizations can build on that with their grants and their programs. But I think definitely if, if you're in a position where you can do that as a professional or as a stable, that's where it starts. No, that's a great point. And it's funny you mentioned the working student, um, you know, program, because I've heard uh, during our research for not only this panel, but Equitana in general, a lot of people comment that that needs to be uh, evolved, I guess, is what they're saying, <laughs> that it's, it's overdue for change. Um, is there someone um, that you guys look up to as a leader of change in the industry, um, or even outside the industry, if there's not someone um, within the confines of the horse industry that, you know, you admire? Is there anybody that you really would like to see kind of spread their, uh, their goodness? <laughs> uh, Carson, let's start with you. Oh, gosh. I mean, I, um, I'm very, you know, I work pretty closely with the American Saddlebred Horse Association in Lexington, Kentucky, and um, I've sat on a couple different boards for them, but I'm just, uh, their, you know, current, um, president is a guy named Marty Schaffel and he is a very successful business person and uh, he's a he's a horse show dad and he had never really you know he didn't grow up with horses he wasn't a horse person but he had a daughter that showed and like so many parents you know they become involved in the sport because their kids love it built a farm moved to Kentucky like did the whole thing sold his business and um I just think because he didn't come from the fold and he doesn't have all of the, maybe the baggage of like, well, this is how we always do things. Right. He has had some very innovative ideas and we're all just like, well, we never thought of that. We've just never done it that way. Um, so I'm impressed by him. We have an amazing marketing director um, who did some uh, great things just socially, like for the first year, they reached out to me and they're like, oh, we're doing a spotlight on LGBT riders for Pride Month. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, because the saddlebred world is, it's so traditional and so old fashioned and so right. kind of Southern. I was like, I have never, and there's been tons of LGBT, LGBT people in the sport, but never have they been acknowledged or a light shown on them to kind of recognize them. And I was like, this is so progressive mm -hmm. um, for me. Um, so I just think, you know, we have some great, um, fresh leadership within our organization. And it doesn't, my point is, they don't necessarily have to be horse people. They just have to be innovators. And we've really benefited um, from that. I love that. Yeah. As horse people, we tend to have our blinkers on a lot of the time. So. <laughs> um, Danny, is there anyone you really look up to? I mean, I think within the horse world, it's hard because I think we have some of the smartest, most successful and intelligent minds in the world whose children ride or they ride and so we have access to some of the smartest minds in the world to create innovation in our sport but 
Also from a personal perspective, like I love to look towards people like Serena Williams who changed the sport of tennis. And, you know, I think we need to look towards role models that have done it in other sports and sort of use them as a guide and say, hey, look what they did. You know, we can do that too. Um, you know, I don't have anyone specific in the horse world whose name I can sort of come up with, but I do know that there are so many people who have the mind to be able to do this and make the change. And I think we can look towards, you know, Sean White and Serena Williams and uh, Michael Phelps and people who have revolutionized their sports and we can do the same in ours. You actually jumped ahead to my next question. So I'll get back to that one. But uh, <laughs> Micah, is there anyone that you really admire who's leading change? I'm, I'm kind of similar to Danny. I think it's like, I look, I grew up idolizing um, like early 90s US gymnastics mm -hmm. and what the, the marketing and what the world did for the sport and making it United, like they made gymnastics the sport of the United States okay. and then the Williams sisters with tennis and um, you know just bringing that kind of element to the sport to make it a little bit more mainstream uh, at least in the US in Europe it's already kind of like that Big riders are a bit of a celebrity. Um, I'm also going to be super cheesy and say Danny was a huge inspiration to me. <laughs> Sorry. I, I like remember going into my first like big international show. I think I sent Danny like a big cheesy text. Being, like, oh. Because of you. Thank you so much. You remember like, clearly. It was amazing. <laughs> so. So I think it, it, it is important for us to find inspiration within our sport, find people you look up to for good reason. And um, whether you know it or not, like I think it's something, you know, someone, one of my students reminded me that today too. She's like, whether you realize it or not, like little girls are watching you, they're paying attention to what you do and how you act. And um, so whether Danny realized it or not, like, she was that for me, <laughs> so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go back to what Danny had mentioned um, and Micah about, you know, Serena Williams and other sports getting revolutionized by um, certain players or certain uh, dynamic changes. Like uh, the NFL always comes to mind, how they brought the viewer closer with the high definition TV, the microphones and the helmets and kind of gave people or constantly giving them a different perspective and a closer perspective of the sport. Um, so Carson, are there any other sports that you think the horse industry specifically to learn something from? Oh gosh, I'm really bad at sports. I don't know much about <laughs> any other sports, um, tennis and riding. Or even well, entertainment I industry. I mean, part of the horse industry is very much entertainment. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, we definitely have, you know, horse showing is really, you know, showbiz. There's a lot of stuff we do that has no reason, but like, it's just, you know, supposed to be entertaining and showy and exciting. Mm -hmm. um, I just think, you know, constantly being innovative and, um, giving people access. I mean, we still, again, like discovery is my big buzzword. Like we have to help people discover what we do and, you know, doing it on your own social media, having, you know, a body cam and saying, I'm going to ride a course today. Do you want to ride along with me? Um, doing Instagram lives, you know, my teacher out here, Archie Cox is like every day, he's like doing an Instagram live, like telling people how great riding is and and um, giving you know a, tit, a, a little taste of his writing lessons online. So I just think you know using media to um, expose people to what we do is such a powerful tool. And like I said before, gone are the days when people would you know go to horse shows with their family in general um, for entertainment purposes. We need to figure out how we can still captivate them and capture those eyeballs and say, look how exciting. Look how elegant, look how fun, look how family friendly um, this sport is. So I guess a very obtuse answer is let's leverage the media that we all have in the literally in the palms of our hands to um, be great evangelists for the equine world. No matter what what discipline it is, we all know that we love horses and they're so wonderful and healing and healthy um, for our souls. Definitely. Um, Danny, is there another industry that you think the horse industry can learn something from? Um, yeah, I mean, my honestly, my my answer is sort of always NASCAR from the corporate 
side of it. Um, I, I don't think we have really any similarity necessarily to NASCAR, but I wish we could at least go in the direction of even skiers. Like, you know, they a lot of skiers and snowboarders started putting GoPros on their helmets and stuff to give that. And I actually, again, not, not to make it personal, but I actually was the only person at the WEG two years ago to wear a GoPro camera on my helmet during my round. Like things like that, like Carson says, it's about change, bringing in different types of media and then mimicking other sports that have done that, like skiing, like snowboarding, you know, that bring, different perspectives so that the spectator can one watch it from their phone you know they can they can get snippets you know in small doses so it doesn't have to be where they sit and they watch a horse show in a whole round they could get into one rider or one horse that they love and, and you have to personalize things so the way that tennis sort of made celebrity stars out of the athletes maybe we need to do that also that's a great point. Yeah, we should be looking in house for these celebrities. Good point. Uh, uh, you know, also for the horses. I mean, or the yeah. horse rider combinations. Uh, Micah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I I would say again, I'm gonna go back to early '90s gymnastics. It was like a whole um, they hired a whole marketing team. Okay, and I know there's now some not so great things about USA gymnastics. <laughs> But what they did for the sport was very important. And it, it, if you look at before that, not a lot of kids took gymnastics classes. It just wasn't a big deal. And then all of a sudden they made it, they made every little kid in America think or want to become that next big gymnast. And it got how many kids in gyms taking classes and, you know, to, again, I think make it feel accessible and out like we reach out and make kids want to be top riders or in barns. And then that's kind of what we build off of. I think that's an interesting point too, because every little girl um, and boys did think they can become the next big gymnast. I don't think there was ever really a thought like, oh, that can't be me. It was like, oh yeah, I can do that. And that's something we're still trying to work on in the horse industry. So um, before we wrap up, I could be a gymnast. <laughs> so I can't even <laughs> my like needs. <laughs> I thought I'd be a gymnast. I thought I could do the one with the, the string on the end of a stick. I thought I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> the twirling. <laughs> um, so for closing thoughts here, um, can you recommend one actionable item uh, to our audience in a way that they can initiate change, whether it's something within their barn, outreach to a local organization? You know, how can they become that catalyst for change? Oh, um, well, I'll start off. I think that, you know, as if you can introduce one person to equestrian sports, you've done an amazing thing. And like, uh, like Danny said, like if you can have a working student or you can open your barn or um, have an internship program, if, if you have the ability to provide that for a young rider, that's amazing. Uh, if you can just take a neighbor along with you to the barn for an afternoon, we have a, a program um, in the saddlebred world called like a home, uh, like a home for the holidays thing and we do it in, around Thanksgiving where people can invite a friend from their neighborhood to go to the barn with them and they can get a free riding lesson. Oh, um, nice. That just, you know, we just want to, you know, again, exposure, exposure, exposure. And if you just get one person involved, that is, you know, has a ripple effect and we can, you know, like everybody said, improve our base and improve our sport because, you know, the more participants we have, the better it will be. And Danny, what are your thoughts? Yeah, same thing. I mean, uh, really, it, we, it, exposure is the major thing and accessibility. So if we can do anything, you know, if other young professionals that don't have to necessarily, it shouldn't cost them money, but they should be able to donate time or they're stable or open things up and expose more kids or more adults, anything we can do, I think it's, again, professional responsibility. We have the knowledge and we have the network we need to open it up to people and invite them to come in. Don't charge them any things. You know, if I have to give half a day or I have to give a whole day or I have to give two days, then you know what? I think it's worth it to expose our sport and make it, you know, like Carson said, if we can get one person interested, you've done a great thing. And that ripple effect hopefully will, you know, continue. So I think we just need, we need to sort of take that step and say, I'm not gonna be selfish about this. And I'm actually going to do this for the greater good. And uh, I, I hope more people will, will do that. 
And Micah, what would you recommend? I'm gonna say the same thing, and then I, but I also want to remind people watching or listening that these are really positive things. These are really positive because it does take a lot to put yourself out there, even as a professional. Like, I don't know how many articles I've said, well, I should write about this. Like, this would be very helpful information for someone. But you get really insecure because of um, the people behind their keyboards and who may think they know more than you, even though maybe they don't. And so um, people are very judgmental um, of all the top riders and the horses. And so, you know, we're saying what it takes is to put yourself out there and the grassroots effort, which is true. And, but for us as professionals, for all professionals to do this, like be kind, be open-minded, um, be supportive and just know, you know, even if there is some pushback of an idea of progress, there always is, um, to not, be so judgmental that you maybe get in the way of progress or find a way to have an intelligent, productive discussion without being negative or, um, you know, just mean. <laughs> so just be, be positive and be supportive. And so we're all in this because we love the sport, um, regardless of discipline, regardless of experience, and whether you're an amateur or a professional, we all love the sport. We want it to succeed. Um, we wanted to survive. So when we're all doing these outreach programs, whether in person or social media, whatever, just be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, I cannot thank you guys enough for participating in this panel. I'm really hoping it kind of, you know, is that catalyst to at least have a conversation at the very least and, you know, get that started. And this is something we're going to be continuing up until Equitana 2021 um, of October. Uh, of next year. So, you know, we want to keep having this conversation. So anyone who's watching, please feel free to write to us. Um, if you have something you want to say to the panelists, I know you can find them on social media, among other resources. Um, but yeah, don't be afraid to reach out. And in the meantime, I am thrilled to be here today. And I can't thank you guys enough. And we'll see all three of you, hopefully, fingers crossed, everything works out next year. And we'll see you at Equitana in October. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll see you in October in Kentucky. Yeah. <laughs> Have a good night. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Bye.